In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Laudato Jesus Christus, this is Timothy Flanders with the Meaning of Catholic. I'm joined today by Mr. Henry Sear. Mr. Sear, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Henry Sear was born in 1949 in Barcelona, Spain, of a family of French ancestry and was educated in England at Stonyhurst College at Exeter College, Oxford, where he took a degree in modern history. He is a historian and writer of The Dictator Pope and is the author of six books on Catholic history and biography, including one on the famous English Jesuit writer and philosopher Father Martin Darcy, and also this text, which we'll be discussing today, Phoenix from the Ashes, The Making, Unmaking, and Restoration of Catholic Tradition, published by Angelico Press. Mr. Sear, thank you for all of your good work for the Church over the years. Thank you for mentioning it. Well, we'll have, uh, if you'd like to purchase any of Mr. Sears' work, they're linked below. But the title of this interview is going to be discussing civilization and barbarism. This is a running theme in his work, Phoenix from the Ashes. Mr. Sear, I really appreciate the way that you begin your book with a, a great survey history of Christian civilization before you delve into the current crisis. And... So I'd like to just start by asking you, how do you define what is civilization in contrast with barbarism? Could I begin by mentioning that the uh, title Phoenix from the Ashes uh, was not mine. Um, I, I finished the book in 2013, and my title was um, The Sickness of the Catholic Church. Um, the, the title... Phoenix from the Ashes was, was, was my publishers. And um, looking at what's happened since 2013, uh, I, I feel that he was uh, over optimistic at the time. However, to return to your question, is, is um, uh, the human culture that results from people living in cities uh, uh, when you have uh, uh, a sufficient number of people, a, l a large enough society, sufficient wealth uh, for literacy, for the, the higher human activities. Uh, and of course, um, uh, we're, we're, we're bearing in mind the, um, the religious aspect, which is uh, obviously the most important uh, part of human life. So uh, one has to consider the moral and spiritual uh, element that is contributed by Christian civilization. And how, so is barbarism simply the uh, pravity, depravity of those things? Well, barbarism is, is the absence of civilization. I think uh, nowadays it's um, uh, used to mean uh, uh, the, the people who are actively trying to destroy civilization. Uh, obviously, this was a feature at the end of the Roman Empire, when the barbarians were in fact coming in and uh, trying to destroy, and, and not, not trying to destroy, and, and succeeding in destroying uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, but um, leaders like Alaric the Goth really want to part, wanted to participate in uh, Roman civilization. The difference nowadays is that the, is the, the, the modern barbarians are, are, are haters of what remains of Christian civilization and are actively out to destroy it. Yeah, I was struck by what you said on page 157. You say that the wealth and comfort of modern life became the bribe by which man was brought to ignore the riches of the spirit. That was the bid by which Satan offered limitless power in this world to a humanity that had been shown the vision of the next. All these will I give thee, if falling down thou wilt adore me. Would you say that the modern barbarism has a conception of wealth that it uses as a weapon, is what I'm hearing, against the riches of the spirit? Oh, absolutely. This is the whole ideology of capitalism. Uh, when people argue, argue the, uh, the merits of capitalism, 
they say, look how much more successful it is, how much richer everybody is. It's a purely materialistic uh, 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 criterion. It's the worship of mammon. Yeah, it's, there was a, a one of the great points, I think, that you bring out in your text is the influence of economics, and we're going to get into that a little bit more. Uh, you point out on 156, you compare this, the much of the apologizing that, that people do, Christians, Catholics today, apologizing for Christendom, you compare it with, a, a as an example, you say, if we found a Jew who disparaged the kingdoms of Solomon and the Hasmoneans and found virtue only in the Egyptian and Babylonian captivities, we would conclude that his faith in Judaism is a sham and that his real pleasure is in its subjection. Similarly, those who reject the prosperity of Christendom and admire only its oppression. So why is why is Christian civilization the greatest civilization? Uh, that's that's a rather different uh, question from what you've just been uh, uh, me mentioning. Well, wh why is it the greatest civilization? I, I think you only have to look at the facts. Uh, Western Europe is the only civilization which spread all over the world from the 16th century onwards, so that by 1914, uh, the entire world was dominated by uh, uh, Christian civilization, or perhaps more accurately, by post-Christian societies. But even before, uh, even before that expansion, I think you could say that uh, the medieval civilization of Europe had sh shown itself uh, the greatest in the world. Uh, w w one uh, can look at uh, phenomena like the, um, the, the, the system of uh, universities that was created in Europe from the 13th century onward. I don't think there's any civilization that has this, um, this system of culture such as uh, Europe had. And uh, the, the, the sublime cathedrals and uh, great churches that dominated the, uh, the, uh, uh, the cities uh, of Europe. Uh, again, uh, religious buildings are, are a phenomenon of, uh, of other um, civilizations, but I don't think you could say that uh, any of them uh, reach the sublimity of the, of, of, of the Christian churches. Uh, and of course, the um, the, 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 the the whole moral uh, aspect of uh, uh, Christian civilization okay, clearly the, the 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 spiritual dimension of Christianity itself. Now, now, how do you respond to the objection that is raised by the modern barbarians that by exalting the sublimity of the Western Christian civilization? You are simply maintaining the the sort of racist rhetoric of the Eurocentric domination of the world. How do you respond to that objection? Well, this stands the truth on its on its head. This whole ideology uh, is aimed at uh, destroying Christianity, and uh, they do this by uh, by secondary means, and they they turned precisely the. Uh, the, the, the cultural uh, and the moral uh, aspect of Christian civilization into a racial one. This, of course, is peculiar to uh, the United States. Uh, it, it, uh, it stems from the, uh, the, 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 the racially based uh, social system that uh, was created in, in, the, in the slave holding states and uh, after the abolition of slavery. Uh, it was a feature of um, it was, was a feature of the whole of the, of the United States, uh, and this is a rather parochial uh, view of things. If I can uh, if I can describe the United States as a as a parish, uh, but it's um, it, it, it's a matter of, of taking this uh, racial aspect and using it as a weapon against uh, uh, what is really a, a moral force, the force of uh, Christian civilization. Now, the, the, you contrast the sort of Whig history of unlimited progress in your book with what you see as a more true reading of history, which is not an unlimited progress, 
uh, what what exactly is the cycle of history in general in these against this unlimited progress that the sort of Whig history has has built? Well, I, I say in my book, as you know, that this uh, idea of progress uh, began to emerge in the late 17th century in the Protestant countries, uh, which began to see themselves as uh, uh, richer and more advanced than the, uh, uh, than the Catholic part of Europe. But uh, you, you can't impose this as if it were a, uh, a truth of the whole of uh, human, uh, human society or human history. Um, th this idea of um, constant progress, as pro progress as a, as a natural feature of human society, doesn't correspond to real history. Uh, civilizations have risen and fallen in the past. The Roman civilization, the, uh, the Chinese civilization, which uh, rose to a great height in the Middle Ages, and then began to fossilize. So um, uh, the, the idea of uh, constant progress in human affairs doesn't, do, doesn't correspond to, to, to reality, but it, ha it has been used by the devil to, um, a, as a weapon against, uh, a, against Catholicism, uh, encouraging people to see uh, Catholic culture as a backward country uh, culture, and uh, as one which uh, uh, first Protestant uh, culture and then uh, humanistic culture uh, has uh, overcome by its uh, its superior modernity. Now, on that note, um, you something you talk a lot about in your book is is beauty and and culture. Um, what is the role of beauty? And you as I quoted from you previously, the riches of the spirit. What is the role of beauty in determining civilization or barbarity? Well, beauty obviously is central. The, 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 the whole of civilization consists in raising uh, uh, mankind to its highest potential. And uh, clearly its highest potential is beauty in one form or another. Uh, in the ultimate form, it uh, it is religious beauty and religious truth. Now, something that you point out that's, I think, very great, especially for English speakers, especially with the Whig history, is that you say that the Catholic civilization extended beyond the Middle Ages. You say that taking the Middle Ages as a model is mainly the habit of the English world. But after the Reformation, the Catholic civilization continued for a number of centuries. Now, is this the Baroque civilization that you refer to? Is that the, the continuation of the beauty? And how did that continue? Yes, of course, uh, English uh, thinkers, uh, Catholic thinkers, have uh, looked back to the Middle Ages and, and uh, seen that as the, uh, the highest point of Catholic civilization, of which uh, they, uh, we've been de deprived by the, the Reformation. But if you look at Italy, for example, uh, it would be absurd to, to say that civilization was in any way disrupted uh, in the century after 1517. Uh, on the contrary, it rose to, these, uh, to, to, to this great height in the uh, in the Renaissance and the Baroque period. And you could say the same of, of Spain uh, or of any uh, Catholic country. So um, uh, from that point of view, um, the, the Reformation doesn't uh, mark a break in, uh, in um, uh, civilization at all. Now, what is the role of getting back to capitalism? And the, you, you begin, you start in uh, the 1600s when the Dutch begin to use capitalism, capitalism. What does that do to the existing, the nascent Protestant civilization that's sort of beginning? What does that do to civilization in general? Well, yes, um, in the early 17th century, um, Holland was beginning to show what uh, Protestant um, uh, Protestant societies would be able to achieve through through capitalism. I, I wouldn't um, 
I, I wouldn't say that it was enormously influential at the time. Uh, I, I think what was more important in the first half of the uh, um, uh, 17th century was what I call the religious betrayal of France in the Thirty Years' War, when it uh, prevented what looked like the imminent uh, uh, victory of uh, Catholicism. And France was a much more powerful player in that than uh, than Holland. Yes, you. This that was one of the striking features in your book. You you mentioned how the Counter Reformation and this Baroque culture, which was continuing on the Catholic civilization, as you say, was really stopping the advance of the Protestants into. Oh, yeah. There, there, yeah. there, there, there was a, a tremendous fighting back on the part of the Catholic world from the second half of the 16th century onward and and uh, 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 very obvious in the in the first half of the 17th century and that was that was wrecked by the um, intervention of France which um, ensured the victory of the Protestant side in the in the Thirty Years War so tell us a, more about that you have some pages you devote to urban the eighth tell us about how did that betrayal come about why did it come about what were the effects of it well, you had a, a very surprising uh, um, set of circumstances at the time. As I say, the Catholic countries, specifically Spain and Austria, looked about to uh, conquer the uh, Protestant forces in Central Europe. Uh, and in normal circumstances, there was no reason why, why, why France should, should have interv intervened. Uh, France hadn't been very effective in the previous hundred years or so, but it just so happened that at that, at that time you had an extremely powerful uh, and able minister uh, in France, Richelieu, who, um, uh, in spite of being a cardinal, uh, chose to side with the uh, with the political and the uh, uh, anti-Catholic uh, side, and he uh, made uh, France the instrument for the defeat of Catholicism. And equally extraordinary, in Rome at the time, instead of a pope who uh, represented the tremendous movement of the uh, Counter-Reformation that had, uh, that had uh, you know, transformed the, the, the church in the, in the previous half century and more, you had an extremely um, uh, politically minded and worldly minded pope, Urban VIII, who uh, chose to take the side of France against uh, against the Catholic powers, and the most extraordinary anomaly. And uh, th this is what um, was responsible for the, uh, f for the defeat of Catholicism at the time, uh, which permitted the, 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 the rise of the Protestant powers, Holland, uh, Britain, later Prussia, which um, meant the complete defeat of Catholic civilization, ultimately. Now, I've heard various theories about this period, in, in particular regards to 100 years before that with Spain. And I know that France was resisting very much the decrees of Trent for some time, and Spain was really sort of the Catholic power bringing things forward. And what would you say contributed to the decline of Spain? Was this a big factor in stopping that, because I've also heard the financial factors as well. Yes, that's true. I mean, there, there was a, an economic decline in Spain uh, from about the 1630s, I think, onward, uh, basically because of the uh, reduction in the amount of uh, gold and silver that was being imported from the Americas. But what really brought about the, the collapse of Spain was the um, rebellions of Catalonia and Portugal. Portugal from 1640 onwards, which was provoked by the um, uh, French intervention in the in the Thirty Years' War, the the the, the military effort of Spain, uh, because because of this unusual challenge, simply became too strong for the for for the capacity of the country. So you have these different Catholic powers rebelling against each other allowing for the Protestants to go on the ascendancy. Now, you mentioned how the, the capitalist 
uh, economy beginning in Holland then again comes together obviously with England in 1688. Now, how does the how do, does the capitalism begin to really affect the civilization at that point after sort of the decline of the Catholic League? Is yes, that exactly. What it in, incidentally, I should point out that this is the thesis of Hilaire Belloc. Uh, I, I don't know if you um, if you've noticed this uh, debt. I, I don't claim to be original in uh, uh, putting forward this thesis. Uh, however, as nobody reads uh, Hilaire Belloc nowadays, uh, it, it's perhaps valuable to um, to uh, put forward this view. I think it's uh, just as uh, valid nowadays as when uh, Belloc uh, propounded it in the early 20th century. Was that uh, Europe and the faith? Uh, well, uh, um, yes. I mean, that, that's, that, that's, I suppose, the, the central book in which he, in which he puts forward his, uh, his uh, philosophy. But there are a large number of other books that he wrote. Uh, he wrote a, a biography of Richelieu, for example, and he does put forward this view that uh, the uh, Thirty Years' War was the was the crucial uh, event in European history that led to the defeat of uh, Catholic culture. So, what kind of civilization pervades the Protestant countries until? The, when the Republican revolutions start to really take hold later on, do they have a civilization going up to 1789 and later? Or is it yes, the beginning yes. of their barbarism? I, I, I don't want to disparage uh, Protestant civilization. The, 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 uh, you know, as, as far as its uh, own merits are concerned, uh, there's no doubt that the England uh, of Newton, uh, of uh, Christopher Wren, of Alexander Pope, etc., was a, a very civilized society. What I, what I would say is that it's a derivative civilization. Uh, it, it's it's not something that is uh, brought in by uh, um, Protestant uh, Protestantism uh, as such. Uh, it, it's it's a participation in the wider civilization of Europe. But there's no doubt that uh, uh, Britain did participate in, in that civilization. Although, <clears throat> as I say in my book, uh, th there was an impoverishment in that civilization, uh, a, a religious impoverishment, uh, to some extent a, uh, um, an artistic impoverishment, because uh, um, Protestantism excluded a great deal of religious uh, artistic expression. Um, and also, the way in which the, um, the, the, the dominance of capitalism uh, corrupted culture, that um, in, in, in England, for example, the, the high points of culture in the 18th century are, are the uh, superb houses built by the aristocracy. Well, uh, I don't want to um, denigrate that as an example of, of culture, but when you compare them to the cathedrals, the great abbeys of of the Catholic world, I, I think you you can say that it's um, something of a something of a corruption of uh, of culture, the materialization of culture. So why cannot if if capitalism can create such wealth, which you don't dispute in your book, why cannot why can it not create the same sublimity of of beauty? Well, precisely because it's uh, because its um, ideals are materialistic ideals. Uh, that, that, that is not the way to uh, to extract beauty from uh, from human talent, from human capacities. That is not the way to extract beauty. The and the way is the spiritual way, as you say in your book. Now. Indeed. You make a, a passing reference to the Eastern Orthodox in your book. I think it's about one or two sentences, but I, I'd be interested to hear your comments about Russia because obviously it's it's it was attempted by, as you may know, the Protestants tried to put up the Orthodox as sort of justifying their rebellion against the papacy. But what kind of civilization do you see in Russia 
during this time, which is really the only free Orthodox country at this point, um, in terms of these notions of civilization, do they also, do they, what is the nature of their civilization? Well, of course, it was a very imitative uh, uh, civilization uh, from Peter the Great onward, uh, but Catherine, uh, uh, Catherine the Great. Uh, I mean, there, there was uh, uh, certainly a great um, uh, artistic advance in, in Russia at the time, but it, but it was very much an imitation of Western Europe. Now, I, I, I don't want to underestimate uh, Orthodox civilization. Up to about the uh, 11th uh, and 12th centuries, um, Eastern Orthodox uh, civilization, Byzantine civilization, was in advance of uh, Western civilization. However, it's worth it's worth asking oneself why that why that changed, why the balance changed, why uh, Western Europe. Uh, started to gain the advantage from the 12th or 13th century or, onward. And there's no doubt that um, Orthodox civilization declined from, from then on. Uh, obviously, the main element in that was the conquest of Constantinople by, by, by the Ottoman Empire, which subjected uh, Eastern Christianity to, um, uh, to, to, to Turkey. Uh, now, Russia emerges from that. Obviously, Russia had originally been a, a highly barbarous country. And when, when, when does it begin to, um, to emerge as a civilized country? Uh, well, it, it, as I say, it's from, from Peter the Great, Catherine the, Catherine the Great, but, but um, nobody could dispute that this is uh, entirely through imitation of, of, um, of Western Europe. That, that's a, yes, great thoughts. Um, thank you. Um, but then that brings up another point, which I believe you mentioned when you mention it, is the subjection of the church to the state. And because that obviously happens in Russia, and it also happens in England. We live in a time where the state is absolute. We have the COVID crisis sweeping the world with the enlargement of government. But we see in this, in this period with both the Protestants and the Orthodox a subjection of the church to the state. What is the effect of the state taking more control? What is the effect on civilization in that case? Well, obviously it's a limiting factor. Uh, you, you see this in France, for example, uh, under Louis XIV uh, and his successors. Um, uh, well, uh, France, France passed through a golden age at that time, but you see culture uh, focus too much on uh, on the monarchy. Uh, it, um, it 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 becomes too much of a state culture, uh, which uh, of course uh, has been enormously aggravated since the French Revolution, where the the, the state has. Uh, got completely out of hand. Um, uh, can one say that um, in Russia um, or, or Byzantium, um, uh, the dominance of the state of the of the monarchy uh, was uh, bad for was bad for civilization? No, I don't think one can. Uh, it, uh, the, the, the monarchy in Russia and uh, previously in, in in Byzantium was probably the main. The main factor in um, making uh, the Byzantine Empire and the Russian Empire the the great cultural uh, places that they were. So you mentioned that the Protestant civilizations did not become totally barbarous. They still had civilization, as you mentioned, beauty. They had beauty. Now, in the Republican revolutions with America, 1776, 1789 in France, is this, do you see this point in history, and again in the 19th, again as the 19th century rolls on with more Republican revolutions, is this the beginning of the barbarism to really, really take hold of the civilization? Or is this just a different civilization? Yes, but um, wh where I would see the real barbarism is, uh, it, it begins with, with the utilitarianism 
of the uh, late 18th and uh, early 19th century. Uh, and of course, uh, monarchic Britain is responsible for that rather than uh, Republican uh, uh, America or, or Republican France. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't say that republicanism in itself is a force uh, for barbarism. Uh, not Republican in, in, in itself, but certainly the the uh, phenomena that came with the French Revolution. They were very barbaric. So can you elaborate on the utilitarianism of England in the 18th century and what effect that had on spreading barbarism? Well, uh, the, the, uh, the, the way in which it uh, eliminated uh, beauty uh, and culture and as uh, ideals to be uh, followed, uh, and substituted um, utilitarianism, substituted uh, usefulness. Uh, the result of this was in the uh, horrible um, industrial towns that spread uh, all over Britain at that time, and the uh, enormous decline in uh, in the aesthetic appearance of, uh, of society uh, in 19th century Britain. Uh, and that, of course, is... Uh, um, greatly imitated in the United States. Right. So, so you're saying that the real force for barbarism really starts to take hold after the Dutch and English come together, the capitalism starts to really take hold in the industrialization. Would, would you say that industrialization as an economic factor, is that one of the main factors in sort of spreading ugliness, the barbarism? Yeah. Very much so, yes. Okay. So what do you see as the, the limits, the successes and weaknesses of the Catholic response in the first half of the 19th century with the Romantic movement, the Ultramontane movements, which respond to this, the industrialization and the violence of the revolutions? What are the strengths and weaknesses? You do have some criticisms for Pius IX, Tell us about this period in terms of civilization. Um, well, Pius IX was, was not a great thinker. Um, and you, you, you've, got two, um, you've got two different levels there. You, you have the, the, the Catholic um, uh, religious response and the romantic response, which are closely related. Uh, uh, that, that's a, a whole cultural uh, world. And on the other hand, you have the, um, the action of individuals like uh, Pius IX. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think you can uh, um, really assimilate the two. Um, Pius IX, um, well, w w what I would say about him is that he uh, encouraged um, the more limited um, party in uh, the more intellectually limited party in the Catholic Church. Uh, unlike um, his successor, Leo the Thirteenth, for example, who uh, uh, was responsible for uh, much more a, a cultural um, revival in the, in the church. Um, uh, Pius, uh, Pius IX was a, a somewhat incompetent uh, ruler of the church. Uh, um, it would be easy to uh, think of ways in which uh, the church could have reacted better to the uh, challenges that it was faced with uh, at that time. But of course, we're, we're talking of an individual there. Now, there's an interesting theme that I see in the later parts of the of the first part of your work, where you you seem to highlight a number of the excesses in the reaction to 1789 in France and the revolutions, and as we come into the second industrial revolution later on. So you you mentioned I I, I as going through your work I I see four different things that are have been prone to excess. One is the ultramontanism, the papalism. Uh, one is the neo-Thomism, which you state was somewhat limited. You said that it was um, 
not creating a, a full philosophical system like St. Thomas, but was page 137, you say it was becoming a store from which infallible answers would be extracted on any subject. So this is the manualism. And then you also mention Pius X's suppression of modernism, which is where you say, on the plea of rooting out modernism, anything but the most conventional orthodoxy fell in danger of prescription. And so then you contrast between integrism which was imposing a strict school of integrism on the middle ground of the church. So I see these three different sort of excesses. And then you also mention in passing, as we get to the Vatican II, the influence of fascism as well. So you, I, I see these different excesses that you are pointing out. How do these, how do excesses, can you describe, first of all, I, I guess I threw out a lot there, but um, can you describe some of what these excess, excesses were what was Vatican II? Was this revolution later on? Was that very much a reaction to these excesses? No, I wouldn't say that it was. Um, I, I think you need to bear. I, I think I think you need to bear in mind is what, what I'm talking about is the ways in which the Catholic Church fell short of uh, fell short of a um, an ideal response to the uh, problems of the time. Um, Clearly, you know, we're, we're talking about limited men. Um, there, there, there's always, you, you, you can't expect uh, all uh, Catholic clergy to be great philosophers and to um, seize the, uh, the, the instrument provided by Thomism uh, at the same level uh, that uh, St. Thomas uh, Aquinas himself uh, provided. Um, so, Obviously, there, there, there's this um, uh, very natural uh, defect that uh, uh, people looked at uh, the Thomas system not uh, as a philosophy, because you know most people are not philosophers, um, and, and even fewer people are great philosophers. Uh, they simply took it as an easy store of. Um, doctrinally correct answers. Um, well, this wasn't what Leo XIII had in mind when he encouraged the Thomist revival. He wanted uh, uh, he, he wanted to promote a revival of thought, uh, and to some extent he did. Uh, but you had a, 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 a sector of the Catholic Church uh, which uh, simply said, We've got to repeat exactly what St. Thomas says. Well, th this is not very good for, um, for Catholic intellectual life. Uh, I, I, I don't want to um, uh, underestimate the value of uh, Thomism to, uh, to Catholic intellectual life. Uh, St. Thomas was the, was the greatest uh, philosopher in the, in the history of the, the, the Catholic Church. But, um, you know, philosophy is philosophy. It's not... It's not just a matter of um, repeating answers previously given by so somebody else. Um, th this relates to um, uh, integrism too, which you, which you mention, because a, um, uh, a large uh, st uh, strand in integrism was insisting on Thomism as the only um, philosophical system in the church. Um, and again, th th this is limiting. Uh, you had a school of uh, neo-Thomists in the early 20th century who were trying to use Thomism more, more creatively uh, as a, um, a sort of seed of uh, a, more, a, a, more, a more modern approach uh, to um, a, a more modern uh, handling of, uh, of Catholicism. Because obviously, uh, you know, Catholicism in every age is uh, confronted with uh, new uh, intellectual problems and you can't simply go on repeating the um, formula that, 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 that were uh, written down in the, in the 13th century. So uh, th these were ways in which the uh, response of the Catholic Church was, was limited and uh, r rather understandably. But I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't say that the, the movement of the Second Vatican Council was a reaction against that. Uh, I, I, I think it, it uh, sprang, sprung from from other from, from other causes. Okay, um, would you say that um, 
I, obviously, the time of St. Thomas, you had rival schools of thought, not just Thomism. Um, was the dominance of Thomism, there was no really rival school per se. Do you think that this could have been more fruitful if there was a more fruitful exchange between Thomism and uh, Scotism or something like that? Um, to, to some extent, uh, I mean, uh, the the second great uh, system in the Catholic tradition is Suarism. And to some extent, that, that, that was uh, a, um, an exercise in incorporating some elements of, uh, of uh, Scotism in Catholic uh, thought. Um, I don't think one needs to go too far in that, uh, in that direction. Uh, um, I would say that I would say that uh, Duns Scotus was wrong in a lot of his thinking. Uh, so you know, it's valuable to take into account some of the things he said. But um, I don't I don't think one should one should be aiming at a synthesis between Thomism and, and Scotism. So the tell us about the so we we have this breakdown of civilization that we've been discussing in this period leading up to the Second Vatican Council. And we have these responses of the church, which you, you show are, are effective in a way, but are also limiting. What are some of the factors that cause then this sort of civil war that gets, gets uh, in the v Second Vatican Council against the Curia, against the, the Roman school? What are some of the factors that lead up to that? Well, essentially... Uh, uh... The Second Vatican Council was the product of modernism. Um, now, you, you, you have two approaches to this uh, particular phenomenon. On the one hand, you have um, uh, some um, uh, traditionists who say uh, 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 Pius X didn't succeed in um, uh, stamping out uh, modernism sufficiently. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, you have the um, uh, line that I would take, uh, which is that... Um, Pius X's approach was, uh, it, it was insufficiently uh, um, philosophical. Uh, it was too disciplinary. And um, the effect it had was lowering the level of uh, uh, intellectual debate, especially in the Catholic seminaries. The, the Catholic seminaries from the time of Pius X uh, onward became uh, too timorous. They they they, they uh, um, uh, found it difficult to to um, escape from the, this narrow Thomism, which uh, appeared to, to to have been imposed. And of course, there was a reaction to that. Um, uh, the Nouvelle Theologie uh, in the 1930s, 1940s, uh, and you had some very brilliant men who who. Um, were part of that movement, uh, and one can understand their reaction to this um, to this um, rather mediocre tradition that uh, that had been created. Um, but, and, and I'm not saying that they were all mo modernist; some of them were, uh, others were not. Um, but essentially, what what emerged in the Second Second Vatican Council was was modernism. Because it, it had not been uh, properly dealt with by by uh, P Pius the tenth. Excellent. So, and what are the what is the influence of the American civilization on Vatican II? It's been called by some to be this period in the Church to be the American captivity, the Church, wherein the Church accepts sort of the American system as the ideal. What do you see as the effect of the American system on the Church at Vatican II and after? Well, I would say that the the, the uh, influence there was not was not very big. Frankly, the American bishops uh, uh, in the second uh, second Vatican Council didn't have a clue of what was going on. Um, no, I mean the the, uh, the, the modernist um, victory in the second Vatican Council was the work of the European countries: uh, Germany, uh, France, Belgium, uh, Holland. Um, the uh, um, the, the Americans weren't very influential. 
except in the um, religious freedom uh, aspect. Uh, there, John Courtney Murray uh, was very influential, and he did uh, have this uh, effect of importing uh, what you might call Lockean uh, or Jeffersonian uh, ideas uh, into, into Catholic thinking, which, of course, is a, is a disaster. Yes. So your book is called Phoenix from the Ashes, and I know that was your editor's choice, but your final chapter is about restoring tradition. So we've, we've surveyed here in this interview much of the disintegration of civilization. And final thoughts and questions here. Where do you see civilization still existing in today's world? And where do you see as the first steps towards restoring civilization where it, it is pure barbarism at this point? I don't see civilization as existing at all in the modern world. It's been completely stamped out, quite frankly. Uh, uh, people who are, who are trying to appeal for civilization uh, are appealing um, for something which belongs to the past. Where I, I, I say in my book, uh, we are like um, Romans in the kingdom of Theodoric in the, uh, in the fourth century. Uh, Civilization has been destroyed. The barbarians have taken over. Uh, now, I, I don't think I don't think we can do anything to, to restore it. Uh, what we can do is uh, is what the uh, um, the monks did in the fifth and uh, sixth centuries. Uh, try to um, keep the, uh, the the written word. Copy the um, copy the the texts of classical civilization. But as far as uh, actually uh, enabling it to rise again, that's going to take centuries. Yes, um, this is a, a difficult period that we're in, but there is a great deal of hope, I think, that your book brings out in the res restoration, which seems to be one of the first steps that I see in your book is the restoration of the, of the Christian memory of the yes. past understanding the, the greatness of the Christian civilization. Any final thoughts for the epoch that we face, Mr. Sear? Well, of course, what, what, what can be achieved is a restoration of Catholic tradition within the, within the church. Now, uh, an enormous blow has been struck in that respect by the present papacy, by, by Pope Francis. Uh, under Pope Benedict, it, it looked as if this restoration of tradition uh, had had a future. Uh, Pope Francis has, has caused enormous damage, but uh, he can't he can't stamp out uh, the um, the understanding of Catholic tradition in the Catholic Church. There are always going to be many uh, faithful Catholics who. Um, Understand what uh, Catholicism means, uh, who um, are not prepared to see it uh, corrupted by the uh, by, by the influence of uh, modern humanism and modern atheism and modern barbarism, uh, and uh, eventually they will prevail in the Catholic Church. But I'm afraid that um, the, um, the, the 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 imminence of that uh, of that restoration uh, has been put back for at least a generation by the present papacy. Yes, but I, I'm thankful for the realism, the hopeful realism that you have here, Mr. Sear, that it will take generations and even centuries to restore things. So that, that's a great lesson for us in the newer generation to take this forward. And your book is a great help to that. So I appreciate your work. Thank you for all of your writings, Mr. Sear. It's very kind of you to say so. So thank you very much for watching. Again, Phoenix from the Ashes is the work we've discussed in this episode. And you can purchase those below, as well as Mr. Sear's other work, The Dictator Pope and his other books. So we'll end today with Alfred Bernard Father for the continuation of the civilization 
in our families as we pass down this great, the riches of the Spirit to our children. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen.